bizarre twist of fate, a Faustian pact was made between the far right, Maggie the Iron Maiden, and the far left, the extreme environmentalists. If CO2, created by burning fossil fuels, was bad, then the British people would have to agree to the disagreeable nuclear power. No generation has a freehold on this earth. All we have is a life tenancy with a full repairing lease. Maggie Thatcher forked up the money for the Meteorological Society, MET, to prove to the world that CO2 was bad and her arch political enemies on the left were ready to back her. So the IPCC was set up under political motives. Is its science, however, impartial now, or do these motives still cloud its findings? Anyway, I would like to acknowledge the fact that I'm only a symbol of a much larger organization, the IPCC, yes. and it's really the scientific community that contributes to the work of the IPCC and the governments. The IPCC has always claimed it represents the vast majority of the world's leading climate scientists. Its views are open, bipartisan, and universally agreed. However, if you look at their makeup, you may have cause to question this. The lead authors select their own teams from like-minded scientists that they have co-authored with. They rarely seek input from those of an opposing viewpoint. Two-thirds of the 53 authors of the key IPCC report chapter 9 belong to a small clique of co-authors. How much were the views of the 700 other leading scientists, as listed by the US Senate, who are climate skeptics, included in this report? Whether you believe in CO2-driven global warming or not, it is not fair to say that most scientists are believers. There is no consensus, and even if there was, that means little. Science is based on evidence, not weight of numbers. So let's look at the evidence. I will now examine what Sir John Houghton and the rest of the IPCC have to say for man-made global warming. I will put forward their evidence and then discuss what others have said on the matter. It's up to you to decide what you want to believe, but be mindful that in many ways the onus is on the global warming lobby to prove to you that CO2 is the main driver. Global warming, or cooling as it may be, is a normal natural state of affairs. It can be explained by many other well-documented forces. So to claim the latest climate changes are due to man-made CO2 is just one option and the burden of proof is on them. Famously, in the movie An Inconvenient Truth, Al Gore showed us the results of looking at the last 400,000 years of ice core data. Ice contains a historical record of atmospheric conditions. As layers and layers of ice deposit in the polar regions, isotopes and air bubbles are trapped. These can then be analyzed to deduce possible temperature and CO2 conditions through time. By analyzing the record of the climate from the bottom of the core to the top, I will be able to see how we move from a cold period into a warm period. Al Gore demonstrated to us that CO2 and temperature levels tracked each other over time, and he claimed this implied CO2 drove temperature changes. However, almost universally, climatologists have debunked this implication. They now agree that CO2 lags temperature by 800 years, that's lags temperature, and thus is not cause but effect. So, CO2 changes lag temperature changes. In response to this evidence, the CO2 lobby claimed that CO2 may indeed be secondary, but its greenhouse effect is then a positive feedback. In other words, it may not start a temperature change, but it makes any change much more severe. CO2 is a minor greenhouse gas. Water, in the form of vapor and cloud droplets, contributes to 90% of the greenhouse warming, not CO2. In addition, we humans only contribute to a quarter, maximum a quarter of the CO2 in the atmosphere. Thus, our direct influence, agreed by most scientists, can only be 2.5%. However, this figure is not enough to explain the 0.7 degrees, perhaps, of global warming seen over the last century. Thus, our climate models use a multiplier of 2.5 on CO2's influence to balance the scales. The existence of this hypothetical positive feedback, or multiplier, is the crux of the matter. Without it, CO2-driven global warming cannot exist. Whether CO2 provides a positive feedback on the climate is highly contentious. Does it act as a multiplier, and, if so, how? The proposed mechanism is as follows. Increased CO2 
would lead to a slight increased air temperature, which would then lead to increased evaporation of water, especially from the tropical oceans. This evaporation will lead to more clouds in the sky, and thus further warming because this layer of water droplets can have a strong greenhouse effect. So, the multiplier occurs because CO2 emissions not only add to the CO2 greenhouse effect, but also trigger further warming by the water greenhouse effect. In principle, this positive feedback loop, which justifies a 2.5 multiplier, seems plausible. However, if you look at the actual available physical evidence, we don't see this phenomenon happening. If anything, the climate tends to revert to its previous equilibrium after a warming event. Luckily for us, negative feedback mechanisms prevail. This in many ways makes logical sense, because if the slightest change to the planet's equilibrium result in dramatic changes, the climate would be constantly going out of control, and it would be a very inhospitable place for us. Ice core data shows us that increasing temperature trends change to decreasing ones, while CO2 levels are still high. Surely this reversal would not be possible with significant CO2 feedbacks dominating. Without these hypothetical feedbacks, CO2 as a driver of global warming is out of the running in the greenhouse effect race. Most agree that a massive doubling of CO2 in the atmosphere can only lead to a one degree increase in temperature. This is because CO2 is already saturated in the atmosphere and can't increase its effect much more irrespective of how much more is added. It may be true that man has elevated atmospheric CO2 by as much as 25% above natural base levels. However, the actual greenhouse effect this directly produces is universally agreed as minimal. The danger to our environment comes if you believe there are secondary positive feedback mechanisms. Can increased CO2 levels trigger a tipping point, out of control warming? Both historical records and observed physical evidence for this hypothesis is scant, and these mechanisms look unlikely. So why are we worried about catastrophic global warming? Where is the evidence? Well, the evidence is embedded in non-transparent, elusive climate models. Modern climate models are relatively complex, and their creators claim they are back-tested and cross-referenced with 30 or so other groups around the world. Agreed, they probably cross-reference well, but that is largely meaningless. Two wrongs do not make a right, and their backtest performance quality, as we'll see, is very questionable. In addition, the climate model champions themselves, the IPCC, admit there are inherent limitations in computer models, and specifically the cloud feedback effects, which is a hugely significant component. Modelers claim that CO2 is the major forcing a driver in global warming. Well, considering that this hypothesis is an input to the model, it's not surprising it comes out at the other end of the model as an output. This is not a robust way to go about modeling a system. The climate is hugely complex. We can't accurately model it currently. We can hardly predict the weather for the next week, let alone the next century. So, we currently have to take them with a large pinch of salt. The 2.5 multiplier effect of CO2 is a crucial assumption in climate models to predict catastrophic global warming. The observed evidence affirming this is currently quite unconvincing. But do they at least, as they claim, tie up with actual historical trends? In other words, do they backtest well? The sensitivity of the climate to CO2 is described by the IPCC as having two parts, the normal greenhouse effect and the slightly more controversial positive feedback effect. The former is universally acknowledged and the latter is somewhat controversial. So looking at historical temperatures, can we observe the existence of the controversial feedback multiplier? Well, in the last 100 years, the actual global temperature increase was about 0.6.7 degrees. Even if you claim it is solely due to CO2, this can wholly be attributed to the normal greenhouse effect of CO2. No multiplier is required. So, at most, you could claim that global warming is due to CO2, but it is not, however, on a catastrophic trajectory. The IPCC do, however, predict a catastrophic trajectory of a temperature increase of 3.4 degrees by 2100. 
This requires the